Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, last time I, uh, I promised you I'm going to explain Angular, the way we describe uh, stimuli, stimuli sizes uh, as angles. So I'll explain it shortly. Some words about the blind spot since I'll be there already in the retina. And then I will review um, the flanker task, the response competition hypothesis, early versus late selection very shortly, and the perceptual load theory, because as fast as possible, I want to reach uh, the challenge. I'll give you an assignment. I'll divide you in groups, how many people you, we are. Ooh, very few people. Good. Maybe in uh, in uh, two two students groups, and then uh, it will whoever succeeds uh, will receive a zero point one extra credit to the final uh, grade, uh, which for the record is after if we curve as. A, we explained repeatedly about the curving stuff. If we curve, the extra credit is added afterwards, so it won't affect the uh, general distribution of grades of, of the class. Um, what else? Use the chat to stop me, interrupt me anytime with the chat, with the, uh, just interrupt me if you have any questions, any comments, okay? I'm from Israel, I feel uh, rejected if people don't interrupt me in the middle of the sentence. Um, let's begin. Ah, and by the way, you probably saw, we have the recording link to the grad school, uh, school symposium and we'll try to uh, schedule another one. You'll be... Oui. Not working. Okay, visual field. So here is our eye and this is the retina. And uh, you can see here the angles, um, and I'll explain it soon. So in the retina, we have the fovea, which is the center of the retina, of our visual field. It's the size in the retina is something like 1.5 millimeters. It, it's like a sixteenth of, a, of an inch. Um, and we have a very, very high density of, of receptors, only, only cones. So we have uh, the, our very high resolution in the center of the fovea. It's something in terms, well, I'll explain soon what is uh, angles. And uh, by the way, Whenever we fix our eyes on something, we are using the fovea, the, the stimulus, the light is falling on our fovea, where we have high resolution. Uh, 2020 vision is, exists only in the fovea, uh, where we have the highest resolution. Outside the fovea, a little bit outside our fixation point, there exists no 2020. 2020 means... Uh, a person that can read these letters 20 feet away from the sign or six meters. So we have two eyes, two independent, two dimensional pictures that are comprised and have a large shared area um, that we interpret, we, we, we converge these two pictures inside our system. And from that, we interpret a three-dimensional word together with many other tricks that we use, like occlusion, something that is behind, uh, sizes. We have a lot of knowledge about how things are supposed to be their relative, uh, relative size to other things. So it's, a, it's mostly an inner interpretation of the word. 
but the physical information that enters are two independent and similar two-dimensional pictures. So this is each eye. So we describe the size of a stimulus as the angle of the stimulus that reaches the retina because the same steam, uh, uh, two different stimuli, uh, 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 let's say here a 40 centimeters uh, wide stimulus, if it's uh, uh, from uh, 70 centimeters away, is ex retina wise is exactly the same like a 20 centimeters wide stimulus that is 35 centimeters away. Uh, while the angle of the image remains the same. Uh, so, for instance, the sun, uh, which is very far away, uh, it falls on the retina. The angle of the sun in our retina is half a degree, which is more or less the same size on the retina of the image, like the moon, but the moon, which is much, much smaller, but much closer would be, I don't know, like here. But in terms of the image on the retina is the same. Um, our visual field, each eye has something like uh, a little bit less than a hundred and uh, uh, something like uh, 150 degrees, the two eyes together, we have between 200 to 120 degrees overall. So if you put your, uh, your hands like this, and you look straight, and you move your fingers, and you move your hand, can you see me? And you move your hand, <laughs> and you move your hand far away, until you don't see, you will uh, you find out that uh, you have more than 180 degrees visual field. Um, so in experiments, when we describe, you you see in all your uh, on all the papers you read, when in the methodology in the methods when we describe the size of the stimuli that were presented to the participants we don't use the absolute size on the screen because it depends on the distance between the eye and the screen so we describe the size of the uh, stimuli as angles so for whichever distance uh, uh, experimental setting uh, is built, you can control and you can achieve the exact same size on the retina by knowing, by calculating according to the angular size. Um, just for you to have an idea, one, one, one degree in let's say uh, in arm's length would be something like uh, the width of your pinky something like that okay um all right the blind spot the blind spot is something that really exists we have two each eye has a huge hole in the retina that we don't see uh, it's something like four degrees is something the size like in, in arm's length is some, something this size. Um, all the time we each eye is not seeing an entire area like a big hole this size no this size okay and we don't perceive it. Why? Be for three reasons. So let me explain for first what is why do we have this uh, blind spot. So uh, here's the blind spot. So it's something like between 14 and 19 degrees away from the fovea. So if the person is looking straight ahead, so the left eye 
is a hole this size on the right side, the opposite, okay. Um, so why do we have it? Here, you have all your entire visual field. Look how wide is the hole. We have no information. Uh, why does it happen? Why do we have the thing? Because, so this is the retina. Uh, these are our photoreceptors. So the light comes from here, bounces back and reaches our photoreceptors, which send, uh, which fire and send information to this middle term uh, amacrine, uh, bipolar, and horizontal mediators. And then it reaches the big, the ganglion cells, which are the, the most important cells that convey the information to the brain. So they are axons, which are very long. They continue. So this is another picture. So here is the our photoreceptors. This is the retina. The light comes from here, bounces back on the epithelium, reaches there, and then uh, the receptors send uh, through the amygdala and reach the ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells sells those long axons to the optic nerve. So here you can see again the uh, ganglion cells. They have a long, and they have to go somewhere in order to reach the back of our brain, the occipital lobe, the cortex, the, uh, the visual cortex. Uh, so this bundle of axons of fibers, which we can see here, which they go and they they have a crossing the optic chiasm, and they reach our visual cortex. These are very long axons that come from the eye, from the uh, um, ganglion um, cells. Well, they have a small, some of them have, have a small stop on the way, and they reach this area, and here another axon. That, okay. Um, so, so that's why here you can see the optic nerves. So that's why we don't have receptors here, because it has to go somewhere. That's the blind spot. The blind spot, is, we can find it easily. So, for instance, you can try it now. Close, close your, if it doesn't work now, later do it at home. It's really easy. Close your left eye uh, with your eye, right eye focus on the, uh, on the plus sign straight ahead and then move closer and the way slowly and somewhere, I don't know, some one, one and a half feet, you will see the, suddenly the, the, uh, the dot disappears, completely disappears. If you move your eye, you are moving your visual field. So the dot will fall outside the, the uh, blind spot and you'll see it. But if you, look, if you fixate on the plus sign, are you perceiving it? Are you trying it? Yes. I think my glasses are on the way. Uh, you with glasses, it's it's supposed to work with the glasses just the same. Um, so why why don't we perceive it if we we are all the time with a huge hole in our vision in each eye? We don't perceive it for three uh, reasons. First of all, we move our head all the time. So so every time the the blind spot uh, is in a different area we also move our eyes all the time uh, so the brain the brain the system is receiving information about that area every time we move a little bit so the information exists and every given moment our system is patching with with information from the previous moments is completing this hole, so we don't perceive it. Um, it's inference. Our system is inferring. Even if we are given a picture without moving our eyes, and we and 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 the information in the blind spot hasn't reached our brain at any moment, if it's a coherent picture that we have. That, the, that 
we can assume what is supposed to be there, even though that visual information never reaches our brain. Our brain imagines what's supposed to be there and solve it. And many people have astigmatism. It's a common problem. Actually, most real astigmatism is our cornea, our lenses. They have a small bump. They're not perfectly round, uh, a small undul undulation. Most of us, all of us have some small level of astigmatism. Some people have more and it really bothers vision. They can it's a, it headaches because every straight line becomes uh, distorted. So uh, you so you wear glasses in a way that it corrects the light that reaches. It, it's the other if it, if your if the cornea is rounded like this, so the lenses, the glasses does the opposite. So it corrects it, and the retina receives the corrected information. That's why people with that astigmatism without glasses. Um, after uh, reading or some visual task for a long time, they have headaches because the, the system is over. That's what is the common explanation, the, that the system is overworking to correct all those, uh, what's supposed to be a straight line and everything is distorted. Uh, all right. Attention, we talked about the most common uh, in the last uh, 60, 70 years in the field, uh, the, the most common definition of attention is the function of selection, of filtering, of choosing the most important information uh, for the purposes at hand. Those can be conscious uh, goals or unconscious goals, like surviving, whatever. Uh, we talked about the main paradigms, sorry, the main paradigms in the field of attention, the Stroop, the Flanker, Simon, the Global, all of them are, uh, assume the umbrella explanation of the response competition hypothesis. Um, so let me remind you, uh, let's talk about the flanker test because it's important for the challenge that we we'll reach soon. So pay attention. You have to understand this part. And if at any given point there is something not clear, stop me because otherwise uh, you won't be able to perform. perform. So in a flanker task, the participants are asked to respond with two alternative hand motor responses, press this button, press this button. So every time you see this target press the left button, every time you see the other, the alternative target press the other uh, button and disregard as much as you can the flanking distractors. So incongruent displays are those that the distractors uh, bear the alternative target identity and uh, which are associated with the in any given incongruent display the distractor's identity is associated with the incorrect response right and in neutral displays the distractors are any other stimulus stimuli stimulus outside the target set stimuli uh, which are not associated with any response for the specific task uh, at hand. So the usual uh, results, the effect itself, is that incongruent displays, they result in longer reaction time. It takes longer to uh, to respond to the target than in neutral displays. It's both longer reaction times and more mistakes. Um, we usually don't see facilitation in, uh, in the flanker paradigm, in the flanker, uh, in flanker task. Facilitation is when you have the three targets, the distractors with the same identity as the target. Uh, so we have only distractor interference in the flank. So the common assumption, the common interpretation 
is that our attentional system, which is guided by spatial discriminations in the case of a flanker task, that is, this, the, the attentional system is supposed to choose to select only the targeted location and to suppress or to not or to avoid processing the distractor's locations. But even though trial after trial, and we are talking about 300, 400, 500 trials in one session, one hour, the participant is looking blah, 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 trial after trial, takes between one second, one and a half seconds between between trials, tick, 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 and every trial looks the same. The target appears in the center of the screen and the distraction, even though all these optimal uh, um, uh, configuration circumstances, it is assumed that our spatial selection mechanism apparatuses are unable to do it efficiently. So many alternative explanations for this failure, maybe because the area of a classic of a traditional flanker uh, task, the area of all the stimuli is too small. So if our attentional uh, um, visual system works like a spotlight and it can focus in, in the area of interest, it cannot focus uh, it cannot concentrate the focus in a, uh, in a smaller uh, area than more or less three degrees, or maybe because everything we every time we see three things like that, even that even though they are not meaningful letters, we still have this automatic tendency to chunk them together as if it was a word. Uh, Gestaltwise uh, uh, instincts, um, or because we, during the time that we are trying to identify the target, uh, our system cannot concentrate for this long. This long, it's like uh, I don't know, four hundred milliseconds, three hundred milliseconds, less, but it's long enough for the system to 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 let resources slip away from the concentrated, from the targeted area or leak. It's more or less the same. These are minor differences uh, in, uh, in the models. Uh, so again, there are two separate parts of the interpretation of the flanker uh, effects. The first is that a spatial selection is, for some reason, intrinsically, structurally unable to select the target. And then, because it cannot, and it takes, we suppose, the same time to fail to do it, to, 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 to collect all this information, and after the information is collected, it, it must be processed and then sending from to the hand. And so then the response competition hypothesis enters and explains why incongruent displays render longer reaction times. So in incongruent displays, the target activates the correct uh, motor response, while at the same time, the distractors, which were unfortunately also processed, they activate the incorrect motor response. Uh, while in a neutral display, the neutral, uh, the neutral distractors were equally processed because the system fails equally in both cases. But those identities, they do not activate any motor response, which means that in incongruent displays, incongruent trials, both the target and the distractors are uh, processed, all the information is collected, they are identified and then simultaneously competing activations and the system needs uh, time to decide which 
to which hand to not let it press the button and which one to let. In neutral trials, there is no competition. And the time that it takes to resolve the competition is exactly the additional time that we observe uh, between neutral trials, the, the average time for responding to neutral trials, which is faster than the average time that it takes to respond to all the incongruent trials. Uh, the size of this thing here is between 20 to 60 milliseconds. Uh, the average time for a traditional uh, incongruent display is between 450 to 650 depending on the on the experiment neutral uh, for the same experiment the neutral trials are usually as i just said 50 milliseconds faster okay in some all the uh, all the main the the, the canonical theories and interpretations and explanations within the field of attention explain the flanker effect like this and this is parallel to other paradigms okay flanker the flanker paradigm is has been maybe because it's so robust so clear so reliable uh, and you can you can use endless different manipulations so it has been considered a kind of a gold gold standard for research on visual selection on visual attention so the uh, so the, the 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 traditional assumption is that first of all our system simply cannot cope with a flanker task in terms of uh, spatial uh, selection and the difference in time like all the other tasks is a post perceptual post perceptual time consuming response competition all right uh, early selection i'll jump we don't have that well, early selection says that uh, no i will not jump uh, that perceptual capacity is limited so in order to identify the target we need the system needs to concentrate the limited resources on the target so attentional mechanisms operate very early in order to concentrate and only after it was concentrated the system can identify the um, the target uh, in, for late selection, the, they, they, uh, they have claimed, the late selection approach have claimed that we don't have a limited uh, amount of processing resources and everything is processed all the time and identified easily. And, uh, and for both the response competition hypothesis is the final explanation for the difference in time. Okay, the perceptual load theory from from first from 95, 94 was the first one, yes. Yeah, so uh, she, uh, Nili Lavi was Joshua Sal first PhD student. They wrote together this paper and then she became a very accomplished. Uh, uh, so she, uh, so the perceptual load theory gain prominence because it's a very elegant solution um, it proposes that both early and late selection occur depending on the circumstances if the task is difficult then all the resources that we have available are exhausted are used during our uh, attempt to find the target and identify it and what happens in these cases in difficult tasks is early selection when we have a very easy task then we we identify the target very fast very easily and then we have surpluses of resources that were unused and these surpluses of resources they start to wander around the area 
and they have nothing to do and they end up processing those distractors and then late selection occurs so why don't we see uh, the critical assumption and the problematic assumption that is uncomfortable for most people even for you guys that for the first time have been hearing it is that there is for any task or for any situation or for time and that is not really explained we have a minimum amount of processing resources that must be exhausted that's why in an easy task the surplus end up processing what we don't want to process uh, so why is this minimum amount based on what? Okay, this is a big question. Uh, well, and the other thing, sorry, sorry, sorry. This I already said. Uh, a very courageous claim that the perceptual load, the load of the task is the cause of the efficiency of uh, the sele of selection and the prediction is that a negative correlation between load so the more the, the the more difficult the task is the better the selection let me say it again the more difficult the task is the more uh, the, the higher the load the less the distractors will be processed, which results in less differences between neutral and incongruent displays, right? I'll explain it soon again. Um, so this is the first and most famous manipulation. So these are low load displays. These are easy easy trials uh, the, ta the target is the letter that appears somewhere along the center row and the distractor appears randomly in one of the four positions around the target up uh, left up right uh, down okay for and um and it's it's low load because you have only one letter to find and you you identified it really fast and then with these uh, surpluses you end up processing the distractors and then because we end up processing the distractors in incongruent trials the incongruent distractors that were processed they compete with the target and then we have response competition and then we have slower reaction times compared to neutral where the neutral distractors were also processed in low low displays but they didn't activate any motor response or no response competition in the high load displays high load condition because the target the same two uh, alternative targets x or z uh, but the target is embedded in a string of letters so we the the participant has to find the letter among the string which is more difficult and according to the perceptual theory it consummates all the available processing uh, resources and then we end up not processing the distractors so in all those displays according to the perceptual theory we don't process the distractors and that's why and then there is no response competition for either incongruent displays or neutral displays and that's why there is no difference in reaction time between incongruent and neutral in high load uh, trials and there are reason low low trials where the distractor was put. is that clear chelsea you got it uh anyone any question okay so i can continue this is important so low low displays inefficient selection 
we end up processing the distractor, and that's why there is distractor interference, which is the difference between congruent and neutral. In high load displays, because all the resources were used, the selection is efficient and distractors were not processed, and that's why there is no difference between this and this, even though all those trials, they take much longer to answer, to react, than all those trials. The incongruent trials in low load displays, they are faster all in all than the neutral trials in the high load displays. Okay? So the efficient selection, the no interface, is the difference between these and this. Okay? So here we have equivalent RTs, here we have slower for incongruent and for neutral, even though all those trials are faster to respond than all those trials. This is another very famous, uh, let me just say something, the uh, perceptual uh, load effect is extremely strong, very reliable. You can do endless manipulations, it will always work, that's why it became so famous and so used and so prominent in the field of attention because it works every time and the the narrative as i told you before is 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 communicative is elegant oh we have but well, nobody is wrong you have been fighting for 50 years nobody you are right and you are right it depends on the circumstances so everybody liked it uh, so this is another uh, alternative manipulation. So here we have uh, the target is, is again either an X or a Z uh, and the target appears within this circle. So low load is when the circle is made of O's or zeros. So it's easy to find the target among this thing. And according to perceptual load theory, the unused resources end up processing the distractor, which are these guys that appear in either side of the circle. In high load, again, we have different letters, so it's, it takes longer, it's more difficult to find the target. And then according to the perceptual load, we don't process those guys. Okay, so what we are going to do is like this. I'm going to explain a little bit more and give some hints. How much time do we have? Half an hour, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, good. So, I'm going to uh, divide you in groups of, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two and a half students in four groups works. No, we are going to have uh, three, three, and four. Uh, so, and then you are going to try to give a alternative explanation for the perceptual load effects. You are going to try to to give a simple narrative, a, a simple story from your intuition. This is a challenge that I, read, I have given in the past to undergrad exactly this class. It was not in Zoom, so but uh, I hope there will be no difference. The knowledge you have, the, if you understood the flanker task, if you understood the difference between when the structure, you have enough intuition and knowledge to come up with a simple story how, why, why here we have longer reaction time? Why here the distractors did interfere? Why they did? Let me give you a few hints and then we'll continue. And uh, I'll, we will jump between uh, groups and see what happens. So these are low load uh, displays. So first of all, the first story, the first problem, the first hole with all the manipulations of the perceptual load theory is that the different the different conditions the different uh, 
displays were presented in separate blocks of trials. So participants uh, responded to, uh, let's say they, they, it was, uh, they sat for one hour, they responded to 200 trials of low, low displays, one after another, and then they rested for two minutes, and then 200 trials of only high, low displays, they rested, and then again, 200 trials of only low load, and then only high load. Instead of putting together everything randomly and uh, high load together, it was blocked, separated. And this is a big hint. This is a big problem. Um, where was I? So this would be, imagine, 200 trials in a row that you see displays like that, that you have to fight this guy. You can see, I, 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 I put this darker size so you can see the objects that appear. So you respond, this tick, 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 tick. Okay, so this is a block, 200, it takes like 10 minutes, one after the other. And then for high low displays, you have these two objects. The target is somewhere here inside. And then tick, tick, tick. So the fact that they were blocked, and there is this different, in, much before you recognize any letter, there is this different in objects. The, the participant is already learning something. You already have an, a strategy that has nothing to do with processing uh, resources. We can explain in completely different ways. That's what I want you to use your intuition, simple words, simple story to tell us um, why, from different reasons, is it possible that here it was, here this, uh, we end up processing the distractor and here we end up not processing the distract. Okay. Uh, I will send you now a PDF with those pictures so you can discuss among yourselves. How, how can I do it? 